you have your Bibles and turn to Matthew's the 16th chapter. You know, we end this series, now we call Called, uh, and, and, and Jimmy did such a great job uh, last Sunday by being called to surrender. We, we kicked off the series two Sundays ago. We're highlighting the importance of understanding that we are called. We are not just making a decision about certain kind of convictions we have in our mind. You know, calling has to do with identity. I think you know that, right? And people nowadays, more than ever, are seeking for an identity. Some are trying to find it in social media, whatever platform uh, they use. They, they compare themselves to that, or they're trying to present themselves in a certain way so people think that is their identity. People find their identity in so many things. Some are trying to do it uh, at their job. Some are trying to do it through their tattoos, right, the ink they have. Some are trying to do it through their piercings. Some are trying to do it the way they dress. All of that, all to express identity. But friend, let me say all of these things together are all in a different category. That, that belongs to, to interest. That belongs to, to kind of our, our focus right now. It's all temporal. It has to do with fashion. It has to be, do with what we think is right right now. Calling has to do with who we are at the deepest level. And that's why being a Christian has to be and is, and everywhere described in Scripture, a calling. It's a different thing. Paul puts it so starkly, he says, what is happening here is a, a transformation of your brain. That is the very way you think. That needs to change. The narrative that you have been living on up until you became a Christian, that, that narrative that told you what your true identity might be, whether that's a survival of the fittest narrative and, or other kind of narrative like that, that needs to go. And there's a new narrative that is found in Scripture, right? Right here, God's story that is expressed most clearly in his son, Jesus Christ, as he came and showed us how to live. That's what we are called to do. And that can happen in any place, anywhere. I trust you know that, right? There's nothing that, that need, there doesn't need to be a specific moment or a grand place or anything like that. If you think about even to the kind of the, the, the beginning of, of, of this nation here, right? And, and, and you know, less than a hundred years after the beginning of this nation, a civil war broke out. And how did that end? It ended in a small little stone house in a field in Virginia when Robert E. Lee just surrendered. And that moment, nothing about that little dumb stone house tells us about the grandeur of what thrusted America into this brand new time and was able to then make it one of the greatest superpowers in this world. You go further back even, and you go back to 1066 on a field in Hastings, England. It's just a field. Did you hear me? A dumb field. And here was this battle between William of Normandy and the Anglo-Saxon king, and had William of Normandy not won, everything would have been changed. The very civilization of the Western culture happened in that place. Unknown, if you go there, did I say that? It's just a dumb field. It can happen in any place, at any time. Great, grand, history-making moments, and that is true also of you. And I want to take you to one of these places today, a little place far away. The best way to think about it is this is the smallest place you've ever driven through, right? You've been through some of these towns, either in West Texas or in Arkansas or East Texas, some places, right, where you, <clears throat> you clear your throat and before you're done with that, you're through the town. <laughs> That's Caesarea Philippi. Six months before the cross, Jesus took his disciples to this far removed place. A place where there was a confession spoken a confession we just heard also today 
Slightly different wording, but the same confession expressed even in the Acts, where the whole body was involved in that. You are Jesus, the Christ, or the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That which was spoken then became the background for what is spoken here. I hope you see this. 2,000 years earlier, thousands upon thousands of miles away, in a small little place, a confession sounded out. That is the very reason that there is a church and a worship service on the first Sunday in October 2024 in Allen, Texas. It's astounding, isn't it? Don't lose this, friends. Here's how it goes. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They reply, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But you, he says, who do you say that I am? That's a question that goes to you, each of you, right? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, or the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus re responded, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. No one yet. Are you hearing this story? You know, I think it was, it's more than just a detail. There's a reason why Jesus had this whole setting happen in Caesarea Philippi. That little place you have in mind that we just talked about. Not in Rome. As if you want to say that, that what that means is that neither then nor now the gospel does not need the approval of the political powerhouses of the pundits of the power centers around to be authoritative and to have power it did not happen in Athens neither then nor now because it does not need the approval of the intellectual elite or the pundits on the radio that you hear all these folks that are trying to tell you this is how things are actually happening in order for it to be truth. It does not need that kind of approval. It, it did not happen in Jerusalem. And if to say it doesn't need the approval, neither then nor now from, from famous kind of pastors and, and well-known type churches, for it to be able to transform people's lives. Yeah? Are we hearing this? The gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to change everything. Maybe there's a little extra thing that could be added here without me getting lost on, on background stuff like this. Right there in that area of Caesarea Philippi, the city of Dan is right there, which is where Jeroboam, and you can read about that in First Kings. I don't need to go into that. Introduced idolatry to Israel, the northern state at that time, after the split of the kingdom. And you can see that there. That is now transformed. And what was said by one little unknown peasant fisherman back then in a group of unlearned, unschooled, somewhat ignorant group of People, just peasant. What was said then is now being repeated. What was said then one time has been repeated a millions and millions and millions of times since then. What was said in that little insignificant place is now being spoken 
in just about every place. So that today, friends, more than 80,000 people every single day for the first time says, Jesus is the Lord or the Christ, the Son of the living God. Are you hearing this? I, I just looked this up. It's an amazing stat that we see nowadays. The world is coming to Christ faster than it has ever done. Not here. And I'll give you some numbers about this a little bit later. Not in, in the northern hemisphere, and certainly not in the western hemisphere, but around the globe. That confession is a call. It's an identity marker. It's also why we ask everyone who gets baptized to express that. Because it is telling who they are from now on, buried the old stuff with Christ, raised to walk in a new life. You are the son of the living God. Not just lip words or words from our lips, but a calling on our life. And if I can speak to you just uh, briefly here about notice what, what is behind here. It is kind of an interesting thing. Jesus cares about what people say about it. You know, the uh, English grammar is somewhat simple compared to Greek grammar. In the, in the Greek grammar, the way this is phrased is that Jesus repeatedly or continuously asked him, who do people say that I am? Imagine this. The son of the living God, the creator of all the universe, is interested in knowing what you think about him. He cares. I know some of you are thinking, Nobody asked that question. Is that what you're thinking? Nobody really asked that question anymore. It's an antiquated question. It may be a biblical question. It may be a churchy question. Nobody's answering this question. If that's how you think, let me help you rethink this again. There's more books that have been written in the last three, four decades than ever in the history of the world trying to answer the question, who is Jesus Christ? Everybody is asking that question. Everybody. Atheists, if you read some of their literature, they ask the question, who is Jesus Christ? Feminists are asking this question. Who is Jesus Christ? Homosexuals are asking this question. Who is Jesus Christ? You, you know, your agnostics are asking this question. Who is Jesus Christ? Jews are asking this question. Muslims in a greater and greater number are asking this question. Who is Jesus Christ? Everybody, friends, is trying to figure this out. Who is Jesus Christ. It is an unavoidable question. And you need to answer that for you. We need to answer that for us. And the answers that come back are so intriguing. Look at it. Like three different answers that come right here. And, and they are answers that are Somewhat the exact same answers that we give. Today, if you think about him in a more kind of constructive way, one of these answers came from superstition, or at least it grew out of fear. The kind of fear that comes when you don't really understand what's going on. Another, another answer came out of just a superficial reading of Scripture. And the third answer came out of this confused comparison. So, so let us talk about this for a moment. When Jesus said, who do people say that I am? They said, some say that you are John the Baptist. That, that was an answer that grew out of superstition or, or, or certainly fear that, that was rooted in ignorance. Just a couple of pages before that, if you go back to chapter 14 of Matthew, uh, you know, King Herod had decapitated 
John the Baptist. And he'd done so because he had a sore conscience that, that John the Baptist had said things about him that what you do is wrong. And then his, his uh, lover, so to speak, had gotten him killed for that. And then when Herod saw Jesus, he said, oh, that must be John the Baptist that had come back from the dead. All kind of things are, are going on with this. It was now the, what the king had expressed, and because opinion makers say something, a lot of people just repeat it. Now, you would never have done that, right? Just say something that other people you heard them say, no. But that's what happens a lot. Famous people say something, and other people just repeat it, regardless how dumb it is sometimes. Here's what is happening here, this superficial kind of speculation. And, and people do that a lot. It must be this. It must be that. We can't be anything other than, wow, this is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Just imagine this. I wonder what your answer is this morning. Who do you say? that I am. There are some that just want to put Jesus in a certain category, like other great people. But Jesus blows every category around. You know, you hear that. Oh, you know, I kind of believe Jesus is a good moral teacher or he has good things to say. But he's not comfortable to just that. Others answered from some kind of a superstitious reading of them. I mean, a superficial reading, superficial reading of, of Scripture. It was those who said that Jesus was Elijah. And I was looking at that, and I was thinking, that's somewhat thought awakening. Is that a word? I just made up a word. It's kind of thought-provoking, maybe, is, is a different word for that, right? You know, we, we are a church who, who loves Scripture, who studies Scripture, who trusts the, the Word of God, who, who get together in Bible study fellowships, right? And, and we are, we're doing all these, uh, these kinds of things. We meet in, in different times of week. Sometimes we meet in our home for prayer and, and Bible study, and, and some study it alone, and we, we love to hold our, our Bible in our hands and say, this is the Word of God. And here's the people who held this Bible in their hand. And their rabbis and, and their, their, their greatest intellectuals who studied the scripture day from day would read page upon page that talked about the Messiah who was to come. And yet, they missed him when he came. You wonder, how is that possible? It, it is a word to us in a way that it is possible to read Scripture in such a superficial way that, that even when we hear it being preached, even when we hear it being explained, even when we study it ourselves, we, all we can hear is what we want to hear. We read right out of it what we ourselves get affirmed by finding there. Are you hearing me? Superficial reading, and maybe it's possible that this day we got to this point where we can't see him when he actually comes. That we can become people who are like blind people in the most beautiful art exhibition that we can't see the beauty around us or we sit in the most incredible concert as deaf people and we can't hear the incredible tunes and music. It is incredibly easy, even dangerously easy, to read the Scripture in such a way that all it does is to affirm us and not challenge us to be like the one we say is the one true 
son of the living God. Some said, well, they speak out of superstition, others speak out of the simplistic Bible readings, and then there are some that just get it wrong because they confuse their comparison. They just compare him to other people that they know. That's the ones who are saying he's Jeremiah, one of the prophets. They, they, they looked at Jesus and they, they saw how so many people didn't care. And they said, that's kind of like with Jeremiah. Or, or they, they, they looked at Jesus and they heard some of the poesy and the beautiful kind of poetic language he used. And they thought, man, that sounds like Isaiah. Or, or they, they saw some of the pain uh, that, that he went through. And so that looks a little bit like Hosea. Or, or they heard a, a warning from his lips and say, that sounds like, like Amos. But friends, although it is a danger that we always compare others to others, oh, he's like that, or she's like that, Jesus blows our categories. He alone, are we hearing this? He alone is the son of the living God. No one else. So this question ought to haunt us is a calling on our life to give the confession that he is the son of the living God. All the way through history, we have seen people trying to, to deny that. There are even still people today who, who is trying to say, well, who is this man? Well, you know, not really all that important. Somewhat important, but not all that important. And that happens even among Christians sometimes. I love the way that C.S. Lewis put it when he says that we don't recommend the Christian faith because it is good, but because it's true. It's not a question of, of a good society or, or, or better morality, so to speak. I want to undermine the understanding that, that a certain level of religious life is, is desirable, but that you should not take it too far. And the last part of his statement that had become so famous, he says, Christianity is an expression or is a faith that if it is true, if it is false, it is without any importance at all. But if it is true, it is of ultimate importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately true or even have, be of moderate importance. If the statement, Jesus is the son of the living God, is only moderately true, it is not true at all. It is not important at all. But if it is truly true, it is of ultimate importance. You know, Lewis says in another place, and he's worth your reading if you haven't read it much. He says, I believe in the sun, not because I see it only, but because it is by that light that I see everything else. In other words, I believe in the sun not just because I see it, but if I had not seen it, everything else would have been dark. I wouldn't have been able to see anything without it. This is where we are, friends, and this is why Jesus is the son of the living God. It's a calling. It's a confession that is not optional. It is not just something I decide to say with my lips. It is what my life is all about. You know, John Stott, the famous kind of British uh, preacher and author, put it like this. He said, you know, the gospel can survive 
a, a complete revolt against any kind of authority. The gospel can survive, you know, the kind of communication and information uh, kind of uh, thing that we see everywhere where all kinds of stuff is said about all kinds of things. But what it cannot survive is if Christians lose their conviction that Jesus is the son of the living God. That no longer does that statement have authority to direct their life. So the real question, friends, this morning is, who do you say that he is? And it's really not a uh, rhetorical question. You've got to answer that. Everybody's asking it. You know, Spurgeon said, the world doesn't read the Bible. They read the Christians. We read the Bible. The world read us. <laughs> 